sir. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Hosea. O.C. it's called in the New Testament. Hosea. Hosea. Prophet. Hosea, chapter number 1. Yes, <clears throat> Hosea 1, 1. Yes. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Notice the length. Yes. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Yes. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, which conceived and bare him a son. The Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name Lorahama. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, now notice carefully, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. And when she had weaned Lorahama, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, Call his name Loami, for ye are not my people and I will not be your God. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. Three children are born. Jezreel means to scatter, but it's a Hebrew word that has a double meaning. Depending on the application, sometimes it means to gather together. That's odd about Hebrew, but it's like that. Then lo rahama simply means in Hebrew, no pity, no more pity. And then lo ami, it means not my people. In Hebrew, lo makes it bad or negates it. It says it's not. So when you find that prefix to a word, lo ami, it means not my people. So the book of Hosea starts out with a prophecy about a woman named Gomer. And she bears three children to Hosea, the prophet. We're about to learn something great, folks, and this is important this morning, about a part of God. When we get into the Hoseas or the salvations of God in the Old Testament, each one has their particular thing that they're going to show you about how that God saved. For example, we know that uh, in the book of, uh, back in the book of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Judges, and we know that before that in the book of Joshua leading up to Judges, we know that Joshua is called in the book of Acts Jesus. And Joshua in Hebrew means Savior. So does Hosea. But there's a little bit of a difference here because Joshua, for example, is the Savior that leads you into battle and allows you to gain that which God has blessed you with and it becomes your property. And that is his place in, uh, in, in, in the leadership as a Savior. But here in Hosea, it's an entirely different uh, direction. Even though he's Savior, he's showing you the heart of God. I don't know of any book in the Old Testament that shows you more the heart of God as it deals with the sinner as the book of Hosea. It's a remarkable book. And uh, I'm not going to be able to, of course, for the sake of time to preach all of it this morning, but I would that you'd come back tonight because I am going to continue on with the children of Israel and what he's going to do with them in the millennium and how he's going to prepare them for the tribulation period and how he'll cause them to pass under the rod. He'll measure them and he'll appear to them and he'll deal with them in the wilderness. So we'll deal with that tonight in the message. But here this morning, we want to talk about Hosea and Gomer. And Gomer, for example, is a, uh, is a type. She's a picture, not only of Israel, because she certainly is that. She's a picture of Israel as they turned and apostatized on God. And when God deals with spiritual issues, he calls it whoredoms. And the reason he does is because they are turning from the truth unto the untruth or to a lies and fables. It's one thing for the pagan to burn his child in the arms of Molech. That's one thing. He was born in blindness. All he has is ignorance and blindness, and that's all he'll ever know. And we live in a nation full of people like that. But it's quite a different matter when you, are, when you have the truth and you have the light, and you walk away from the light and you walk away from the truth. This, my dear friend, is a judgment that is far greater than anything some blind pagan would have to do with. And this is what happens in the book of Hosea. She had the truth, knew the truth. Israel had the truth, knew the truth, knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Yet they walked away from the truth. 
Hosea is a prophet. Being a prophet, he's a peculiar type of person. Being a prophet, he's one who is called by the hand of God directly and given a message to give to someone. Hosea, of course, is prophecy. He goes to marry a woman that is sold. And because she is sold, she's sold because she is in adultery. And she's no good to anyone anymore. For example, Isaiah was told to go naked and barefoot for three and a half years. Why? Because God used Isaiah to show the children of Israel what it was like to be without the covering of the grace of God and the forgiveness of sin, walking naked, amen. And the Bible said the eyes of the Lord goeth, runneth to and fro. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Nothing can be hid in his sight. You can dig all the holes you want to in your tent and hide your sin, but you can be sure that it will be found out. Jonah, for example, Jonah's a prophet and he's locked up inside a whale. Amen. If you don't believe that, I believe the Bible. The Bible, if it said Jonah swallowed, swallowed the whale, I'd believe it. <laughs> Say, that's stupid. No, God Almighty can do anything. But the, the whale swallowed Jonah, and he was behind bars. He was locked up. You see, that's the way it is. The Lord Jesus Christ said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, so must the Son of Man. So Jonah becomes a type of Christ, and he is made free because he is allowed to come out of it. That's a picture of the sinner who is made free. If the, if the Son make you free, you're free indeed. Then there's Jeremiah. God said, Jeremiah, don't get married. Now, Jeremiah was the prophet that prophesied right before they were carried off into Babylonian captivity. It's important to remember this. He wept and he cried, and we read about that in the book of, uh, in the Old Testament, where he, re where he poured his soul out to God because of his people. And here's what God said to Jeremiah, don't get married, don't have children. This is the Lord saying, though I espoused you unto me as a wife, look what you have done. Jeremiah, I want you to feel what it's like. And then finally we have Ezekiel, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. Ezekiel, his wife died and God said, don't go to her funeral. No, don't go to her funeral. I don't want you mourning for her publicly. Here we have these prophets feeling in their heart what God felt. And this is important. This is what makes preaching. This is what makes teaching of the word of God. Is to feel something greater than yourself. Is to feel something spiritual. And spirit is life. And no spirit, no life. Amen. And so Hosea takes his place. He takes his place as, as, as a prophet of God with God speaking through him and revealing to them what they should understand about the nature of God. Gomer is on, uh, she's taken and she finally put on the chop block. She's on the selling block and she's up there to be sold. And this, of course, is where we all wind up one day if we don't have the Lord. The devil is the God of this world. And the Bible tells us over and over in the Old Testament, they sold themselves unto sin. They sold themselves unto sin. You see, Satan has a legal claim to this world. And when you sin, he has a legal right to come down on you because of it. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, there's something there that can stop him. But in the Old Testament, she was sold. She was on the block to be sold. And the Lord Jesus Christ in his, script, in his word tells us about people who've come to the end of their way, to the end of their road, and there's not a thing that anybody can do to help them. They are totally and completely helpless. The man sitting by the pool of Bethesda tried to get up and get into the water, but somebody beat him every time. It is that situation where you are helpless. And that's so very, very important in understanding your relationship with God. He wants you helpless. Once you get to the point where you no longer trust in yourself to better your life and you look to your righteousness to make yourself better and try to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, God wants you past that. He wants you to where he can help you. And if he has to put you in a blind spot like that, he will. And so he said when Gomer was up on that and he got it and made the sacrifice and paid to bring her down, and Gomer was facing her husband, Hosea, now look carefully. It was after the price that was paid to buy her back. It was after that price was paid. It wasn't because she repented. It wasn't because she deserved it. When she was standing up there to be sold, she wasn't worthy of anything. But Hosea would pay the price. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ would pay the price. Not because we're worthy. Not because we ask him to. Not because we deserve it. He still paid the price. 
We were standing guilty before God, and he paid the price. I'm sure in, Hose, in Gomer's heart, she began to think, good night, what have I done to this man? I'm sure her conscience, no doubt, had begun to smite her. And no doubt in her heart, it broke her heart to think of how he had felt and how she had hurt him. And no doubt in her heart, she no probably looked at him and said, now, why would somebody do this for me? Why would you do this for somebody like me? And maybe deep down in her soul, she began to search her soul and find out what was there and what wasn't there. And it is deep in the soul of a man where your relationship with God is born. It is not born in the intellect of your mind. We live in a generation today that makes it so easy. A generation today that is push button salvation. A generation today is like you, it's like a microwave. Push it in there, push a button, pull it out, and everything's okay. We live in a church age today where it's a bunch of empty words and it produces no change in the heart of the individual. The only thing that could get Gomer right with God was not being bought on the chop block. That was paid for. It was her heart and her relationship here with Hosea. In other words, it produced repentance. Repentance is so necessary. Repentance is preached against. I marvel at how these fellows get on YouTube and they, they come down against me or anybody else that preaches repentance like we're preaching works. No, my dear friend, let me tell you something. Except you repent, you'll likewise perish. Repentance is a work of the Holy Ghost of God. Repentance is the fruit that God gives you when you are able in your heart and in your soul to see yourself as God sees you and understand that salvation is not a bunch of stuff you believe. Salvation is your heart. With a heart man believeth into righteousness. For example, if you're confronted with your sin, and you will be, the Holy Spirit confronts you with your sin. There's nothing you're going to do that you're going to get away with. He knows everything you've ever done, every thought you've ever had. And when he confronts you with it, if you come back and say to God, well, we all do. He that have without sin, let him cast the first stone. Then the attitude that you have taken is no longer an attitude of repentance. You're blaming somebody else and shifting the blame. And there's an awful lot of people who go to churches today that shift the blame. They say, we live in a bad culture today. This is just the way everybody is. Yes, but you don't have to be that way. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to live the way they do. Just a matter of fact, think about this. There are people stumbling out here in this world that have never seen a light in their life. There's a lot of people out here, the only thing they've ever seen is the dead hypocrisy and apostasy of the church in America. Some of the doctor told me the other day, and the doctor, my doctor told me the other day, he said this girl came from Iran. She came over to America, and she's a Christian. I suppose she came as a missionary or whatever, and she left and went back to Iran. And you know why she did? He said she could not stand Christianity in this country. It was so sick and vile. Now that's pretty bad for a girl to come from Iran and give you a good assessment though, a right assessment of what's going on in America. I beg and plead with you today. It is not how this fellow next to you is living. It's how you live. And it is the way you answer to God. It's what is in your heart and in your soul. And your attitude has everything in the world to do with it. Now, don't you look at something in the book of Hosea. I want you to look at something in the book of Hosea that's very important because you'll begin to understand the heart of God. Follow with me now. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 6, I'll turn there and read. If you want to, you can. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 6. When I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. The word of God says simply live. There's power in that word live. When I get up here and preach to you the word of God, I have no power but the word that goes forth from my power, from my mouth, dear friend. It is the power of God. Think about that. You see, you mean to say to me, preacher, if I believe the Bible, you better believe. If you believe the Bible, you have not only received the power of God, you've received the living word of God. But the problem is they won't. But listen carefully. I can't get out here and get away from this. We'll run out of time. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee. You remember the book of Ruth? And covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered. Watch this now. A covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. I don't know if you go any further back than this. Here's a baby. 
Here's a child. And the Lord has bound himself with a covenant. And he has said to them, you're mine. Yeah. <coughs> it's almost like a marriage contract. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost yeah. like a betrothal. Yeah. It's almost like the father is saying, I want more with you yeah. than simply being a nation on this earth. You're my people. Yeah. And you will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. So therefore he becomes a father to them. Now in the book of Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 9, here's a beautiful scripture. It says, in all their affliction he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. It's showing you how it all began. And that word presence, I looked at it, I thought, now what is that? That word means to repel, repel. What does that mean? That means that if you've got the Holy Ghost in you, if you're born again, you do. That Holy Spirit in you repels all kinds of demonic powers and forces that come against you. The angel of his presence repelled. It repelled. It pushed away. That's what that means. All that would come against them. Now look at Hosea chapter number 4 and verse 17. Hosea 4, 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Ephraim was one of the two sons of Joseph. Remember Joseph? Manasseh and Ephraim. Remember that? Yeah. And Jacob had a special blessing for Ephraim over Manasseh. He crossed his hands. Remember that? And Ephraim became the largest tribe of the northern ten tribes. Right. It became so dominant that Israel and Ephraim were interchangeable. That when he said Ephraim, he just as well have said Israel. Yeah. And so here in the book of Hosea, the Lord is reminding them, I'm talking to Israel, but I'm going to address him as Ephraim. It's like Israel and Jacob, we find that. Thou worm Jacob, you know that? How many are following me here today? The Bible's a good book, it's a deep book. This book will bless you. And when he said, thou worm Jacob, but Israel is a prince with God, but it's the same man. Same man, Ephraim and Israel, same people. But watch this. He said, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. The heart of God begins to cry out for his people. Let him alone. There's nobody on this earth that moved the soul of God like Ephraim did, like Judah did, because they were his apple of his eye. They were his people. Can you see an application today? Are we not bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh? Are we not washed in his precious blood? Am I not sealed with the Holy Spirit of God? Do I not? Do I not is my, not my name written in the Lamb's book of life? Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. And no man wrote that name either. And therefore, no man can take that name out either. Amen. So in the book of Hosea, chapter 5 and verse number 11, watch this move through Hosea now. Hope you don't miss this. Hosea 5, 11. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandments. In other words, he left them. Therefore will I be into Ephraim as a moth and the house of Judah's rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, they went, Ephraim, to Assyria and sent to King Jerob. Yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound? This is when a man realizes he's got a problem and he starts running to psychology. He runs to religion. He runs here and he runs there. It doesn't do him any good. She'd spent many things on many physicians, was none the better. So the Bible says here, I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. That's bad stuff. And remember this, folks. If Almighty God is against you, who can be for you? <laughs> but I'm glad it says it the other way, don't you? But if God be for us, who can be against us? Now I want you to notice what follows here in verse 9, chapter 9, verse 16 of Ephraim. Hosea, chapter 9, verse 16. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Watch this. Yea, though they bring forth, this is the birth of a child, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. God says, I'm going to cut their posterity off from the face of the earth. Man, that's rough stuff. Good night. That's what they're doing here in America. They got 60 something million they've done that too. Quack them off. Little innocent babies jerked out from their mother's womb. Hosea 9, verse number 13. Now look at this thing. 
Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, is planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. Now, you're going to learn something about the heart of God. Follow with me. You're about to learn something about the heart of God. Look at chapter number 11 and verse number 8 of the book of Hosea. Hosea 11, 8. After you remember all the studies said about Ephraim, look at this. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboam? My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. Let that sink in. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. Watch this now, for I'm God. <laughs> and not a man. The Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into this city. Boy. Did you get this now? Jeremiah chapter 31, verse number 20. Is Ephraim my dear son? Question mark. Is he a pleasant child? Question mark. For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels will trouble for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. That's God. He's not a man. And there's something else about it, too. Before you jump up and start blasting, read all the Bible. Read it all. Read everything it has to say about a subject. Read it all. How many of you got a hold of this here this morning? This is the heart of God speaking. On one hand is the holiness and righteousness of God. No question. Holy, holy, holy. Well, that stops me right there. I'm shut out. I'm finished. We're all finished. You can't approach him. Unapproachable. Separate, separate, separate. That's what holy means. It doesn't necessarily mean good and righteous. These are all good things. But you look at the etymology of the word holy. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Separate, separate, separate. And then through the Bible, he begins to teach you how to come into that separateness. He begins to teach you how to approach that one that is unapproachable. He teaches you how to speak to that one that you can't know about. That is the revelation of God. Every place in the Bible that talks about how you can know him, you can approach him, you can understand him, it's God telling you how it can be done. And the heathen have no idea. Canst thou by searching find out God? Think about it. Well, you know, there may be a man upstairs. And I believe in a supreme being. Sure, I hear all that garbage too. But do you know him? Now watch this here. Isaiah 57, verse 16. For I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wroth. For the spirit shall fail before me in the souls which I have made. Verse 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth. Now listen to this. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth. Did he have a right to be wroth? Sure he did. And I smote him. I hid me and was wroth. He hid himself. Heavens were brass. No answer. No, no, nobody present. And he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. In plain words, I did this. I tried to move in his soul. I tried to get his attention. Froward means to walk on with with, with an impulse against the truth and against the light. Yeah. That's what it means. Yeah. Now, he said, I, and, they, and they moved forwardly against the truth. And then he said, it, I have seen his ways. I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I like that restoration. A lot of people in the Christian church Forgiveness as far as they go, and thank God for forgiveness. Yes. Hallelujah to God. Yes. Don't you think for a minute that I'm belittling forgiveness. Forgiveness no. is base, bare, bottom line one. Yes. To be forgiven is to be made free. To be forgiven is to give, just to have life again moving in your soul. Yes. 
But there's also a doctrine in the Bible that has to do with restoration. Yes. To restore. Restore. Yes. Jeremiah 9, 23 is my favorite passage in the Bible. I quote it all the time. Write it down. It's beautiful. Yes. This is one of the most beautiful things you've read in your life. Listen to this. Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus saith the Lord. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, that's mercy, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. I'll tell you one day, we're going to see a holy God. We're going to see a righteous being. We're going to, we're going to be surrounded and embraced with goodness, righteousness, holiness, the presence of God. Amen. Now, I want you to look at Joel chapter number 2, verse 25, because we're going to restore Gomer. She's been forgiven. Hosea loves her. He took her back in. He bought her and paid for her. But now she needs to be restored. God doesn't do a half job with you. No, 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 no. He's able to save to the uttermost all that come to God through him. Uttermost. Joel chapter 2 verse 25. I will restore to you the years the locust hath eaten. The canker worm, caterpillar, palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Did you see that? Isaiah 57, 17 again. For the iniquity of his covetousness, covetousness was I wroth and smote him. I hid me, was wroth. He went on forwardly in the way of his heart. I've seen his ways, will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. Even though he was obnoxious, rebellious, hard-headed, he said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to restore him. Now, how many have ever heard of a generational curse? You hear this stuff all the time. Generational curses. Let me read what it says in Exodus. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and to the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You say, is that true? Absolutely true. But that, that visiting iniquity is quite a subject in itself. There's quite a thing going on here. A lot of people say, Oliver Wendell Holmes, for example. How many has ever heard of this man? He was, a, he was a Supreme Court Chief Justice. He said, three generations of imbeciles is enough. <laughs> So what did they do? They got into eugenics and sterilization. Yeah. That's what they did. Yeah. And you know where it came from? It came from the universities in America. I bet you didn't see that on CBS, NBC, and ABC, CNN, and the rest of them. Bet you didn't. I bet you they're trying to keep that as quiet as they can. Yeah. Hitler took that and he put it to practice. Right. So what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say that some people think that you were born under a curse. And the only way to eliminate that curse is to eliminate you and your family and your and your and your and your and, and all of that. Just to get rid of you. Because you're never going to amount to anything. Nothing good will ever come of you. How many of you know what inbreeding is? All right. If you get on YouTube, you can see some poor souls. God bless their heart. I feel so sorry for them. Inbred, their mind is just scattered, their facial features and their body. It, it, there's degrees of it. Also, if you go to Europe yeah. and you look at the royalty of Europe, yeah. did you know this? Right. Did you know that they married within their royalty and they kept that, ma they kept that royalty? Uh, yeah. Nobody came into it. They wanted to keep the power, so they, they spread it apart. Here, France is related to England, which is related to, uh, to Germany and Austria and so forth and so on. Yeah. But what did it do? It produced some problems yeah. in breeding. So why I say that? I say that because some people say, you know, you, maybe you just have a problem with something like that. And, and you know, you're never going to be any good. And there's, there's, you know, 
there, there's nothing that can ever be done for you, but maybe I can do something for the future. And people that hold that over your head are trying to control you and they want something from you. A generational curse is preached all the time from the pulpits in America. And I'm going to tell you right now in simple terminology, it's a bunch of garbage. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you why. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 3 says, Wherefore I give to you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So what's that got to do with it? Next verse, Colossians 3, 3. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And I mean that's literal. I am in Christ. I am in him. If you can't curse Christ, then you can't curse me. 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians 1, who hath sealed us yeah. and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Ephesians 1, In whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now that sealing is a multifaceted thing. Sealed, ownership. Sealed, keeps out. Sealed, keeps in. A lot of things that have to do with the sealing. But verse uh, chapter 4 and verse 30 of Ephesians, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. Well, if I'm in Christ, my life is hid in Him, and I'm sealed, and there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You cannot condemn them. You can't judge them. You can't do a thing with them. You cannot curse me. Amen. And folks, let me tell you something. I don't have the greatest genealogy. Don't have the greatest genealogy. But I know one thing. When God saved me in 1973, he put me in an entirely new family. Amen. Completely Glorious. new family. Glorious. And I'm going to close with this this morning. Because here I want you to see the heart of God again. In the book of Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 15. Turn there with me. Boy, isn't Hosea a nice book? Isn't it a wonderful book? Hosea chapter 2, verse number 15. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there in the days of her youth and in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. My, what a thing. So what are you talking about, preacher? How many know where the valley of Achor? You know what that represents? You have to remember a little bit about the Bible now. Who was it that was stoned to death with his wife and his children because he hid a golden a wedge of gold and some Babylonian garments. Is Achan. Where was, he, where was he stoned to death? Valley of Achor. So from that day on to the children of Israel, you mentioned the Valley of Achor, you're mentioning a place of a curse. Curse. A horrible, horrible place. A place of a curse. God says, I'm going to turn that curse into a door of hope. In plain words, here's what I'm saying to you this morning. Your life has been messed up and you've sinned and done everything wrong. Okay. Well, join the club. We've all sinned. But what you do with the future is what matters with God. He will take the very pit that you found yourself in. Are you listening? The very pit. And you will find yourself in a hell hole somewhere if you go away from God. He'll take the very pit that you find yourself in. And he'll open up a door to a new life. If you'll trust him, let him forgive you. Let him cleanse you. He will not only forgive you, he will open up a door into a new life for you. Do you want a new life? Do you want a new one? That's what happens when you come under the hand of God and you are restored. And now listen carefully and I'll shut up. God has his people in the church. And to them, he says, and not everybody, but to some, he says, ye that are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself also. We're not here to condemn you and kick you down and kick you while you are down. No, sir, that doesn't mean we condone anything. We're not condoning anything. What we are telling you is that there's forgiveness for your sin and there's a door that can be opened. And the door, friend, the door is going to be the very spot where you're cursed. Right there. That's important. It'll become a door of hope. Father, bless your word. I thank you for it this morning. 
I thank you for giving me strength one more time to stand up here. Bless your righteous name. You give me a reason for living. You give me a reason for being. I don't wrestle with this. I know my calling, and I, I, I rejoice in it, and I thank you for it. Now, Father, I pray that what's been said today is going to help somebody. Help them. Maybe they need to come down here today and say, Lord, here's my pit. Here's my, here's my valley of Acor, and I don't seem to be able to get out of it. I seem to be locked in it, and I, can't, I just can't do anything with my life, and maybe I am cursed under a generational curse. And Lord, what, what can I do? My Father, let the light shine in and open the door for them. Open the door. Show them how that you've got a brand new life for them. And it's going to be a life filled with joy, victory, and that is theirs. In Jesus' name I pray. While your heads are bowed, nobody looking, anybody like to come down here this morning and pray, just talk to God. You don't have to talk to me. You don't have to talk to anybody. Come down here and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, you need to tell me that you can come right into the very spot I'm in. That's exactly how God does. He doesn't ask you to come to him to be saved. He comes to you. He comes to you and he convicts you. Then he draws you to Christ. The Bible said, I came into the world to seek and save that which is lost. He seeks you. You know the worst things that will ever happen to you? It will finish you is when you lose your hope. Yes. That will do you in. It will. It will do you in. It will finish you. No hope of ever getting any better. No hope of ever getting any victory over this sins eating me up. No hope of ever having a new life or something worthwhile. I've wasted me. You're probably fully, completely guilty for all the hell you've brought down on your soul. But that's not the issue right now. The issue is he'll take that and turn it into a door of hope. Amen. Anybody say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me this morning. And I'll be glad to pray for you. There's nobody looking. This is not gawking hour. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you back there. God bless you on further back. God bless you over here. Yes, sir. God bless you. God bless you. I'm a minister of the gospel. I have a, I have a covenant relationship with God to have a spiritual, spiritual understanding and oversight. The Bible says we watch for your souls and I must give an account. And I don't, that's not a game. I've got to give an account, so I have to give you the truth. So therefore, anybody else, raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher. Pray for me, because I, I believe you want to help me. God bless you back there. And I certainly do. God bless you here. God bless you in the back. It's, it's to help you. Oh, God bless you. Father, I've seen the hands. Lord, you know I'm just the preacher. But my Father, I call upon your name because I know what you can do for people this morning. I know what you did for me. I know where you found me. My Heavenly Father, some of them in this house may have lived for you, served you, even pastored. I don't know. Lord, you know. But they, they, they loved you. They were faithful to you. And then something came into their lives, whatever it was, however it happened, and it drug them down. And now they, don't, they can't believe they're where they are. Lord, help them to understand you have not forsaken them that where they are now can become a door of hope for the future. In Jesus' name, amen.